looking at verses 22 through 24 here in Ephesians chapter 5. I'll begin reading at verse 22, read to verse 24, and give you a study on those verses. Wives, <laughs> submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Okay, let's close with prayer. <laughs> For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And so I'm going to begin with a riddle. And I'm going to read it just to make sure I say it right. Once upon a time, a perfect man and a perfect woman met. After a perfect courtship, they had a perfect wedding. Their life together was, of course, perfect. One snowy, stormy Christmas Eve, this perfect couple was driving their perfect car along a winding road when they noticed someone at the side of the road in distress. Being the perfect couple, they stopped to help. There stood Santa Claus with a huge bundle of toys. Not wanting to disappoint any children on Christmas Eve, the perfect couple loaded Santa and his toys into their car. Soon they were driving along, delivering the toys. Unfortunately, the driving conditions worsened, and the perfect couple and Santa Claus had an accident. Only the driver survived the accident. Who was it? Well, the answer is the perfect woman. She's the only one who really existed in the first place. Everyone knows there's no Santa Claus, and there's no such thing as a perfect man. <laughs> so, if there is no perfect man and no Santa Claus, the woman must have been driving, which explains why there was an accident. <laughs> okay, here we go. Yes. As we begin our study here, Paul has just instructed the church concerning what evidence is a spirit-filled life. And he contrasted walking in the flesh with walking in the spirit. The earmarks of walking in the flesh were described in chapters 4 and chapter 5. He wrote of a, a spiritually dark way of thinking that was evidenced by various sins. He spoke of hardened hearts, licentiousness, uncleanness, lying, stealing, obscenity, and sexual sins. These are the sins that characterize the pagan religious system that the unsaved Ephesians had once practiced and were practicing. Included in those practices was the festival of Bacchus, which was a drunken orgy. So in contrast, Paul had gone on to describe a life that was filled with the Holy Spirit. And he said it's filled with fellowship and worship, with thankfulness. It's centered on Christ. It's earmarked by submission to one another. And he made it clear that someone walking in the Spirit would be with humility submitted. A believer walking in the Spirit loves other believers and lives at peace with them. So Paul knew that a church could split if pride and self-seeking invaded it. There needed to be an attitude, an attitude of willing submission to other brothers and other sisters. So to be effective, the church had to live in love and humility and had to avoid selfish ambition. Now, these qualities that he wrote about are the fruit of uh, being filled with the Holy Spirit. So he'd been writing concerning the work of the Spirit, and he was speaking concerning the work of the Spirit in the church. So he now approaches the subject of the work of the Spirit in the family, and he begins by addressing the Christian wife. Now, in verse 21, Paul had exhorted the church to submit to one another in the fear of God. That is called a call for mutual submission. And it flows into his instruction concerning marriage. Now, submission is part of God's intention for an orderly home, church, and society in general. And the principle of submission characterizes the entire Christian life. The Bible teaches us to be submitted to God. In, in James, for example, chapter 4, verse 7, it simply says, Therefore, submit to God. We're to be submitted to biblical leadership. Hebrews 13, verse 7 Obey those who rule over you and be submissive, for they watch out for your souls as those who must give account. Let them do so with joy, not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. 
We're to be submitted to government. Romans 13.1 tells us we are submitted to governmental authority. And again, I mentioned this in chapter 5, verse 21 here in Ephesians. We submit to one another. Now, when we speak of submission, and we're going to get to that in just a moment as it's uh, as it occurs in the, the life of a Christian wife, Jesus is the model of our of submission. He's the model of perfect submission because he was submitted completely to his father. In John 4, verse 34, he has said it like this. He said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. In John 6, 38, he said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Jesus' submission is evidence to any who could see and would listen. So we have an example of this when Jesus healed the centurion's young servant. This, uh, this uh, centurion's young servant boy, whom he loved, had been paralyzed. He was in terrible pain. And the centurion had come to Christ and had asked for help. And Jesus had said, and you know the story, it's found in Matthew 8. Jesus said, I'll come at, to your house and I'll, and I'll minister to him. Well, in Matthew 8, verses 8 and 9, this is how the centurion responded. It says, the centurion answered and said, Lord, I'm not worthy that you should come under my roof, but only speak a word and my servant will be healed. He goes on to say, for I also am a man under authority, having soldiers under me. And I say to this one, go, he goes to another, come, he comes to my servant, do this, and he does it. This man had seen in Jesus the model of submission. And he called it out. He said it. I've seen this. I'm like you. I, too, am under authority. Jesus was one under authority. So to su a submission to proper authority helps to create an orderly church and society, as well as a family. Now, in the home, God has given leadership authority to the husband, the father. In 1 Corinthians 11, verse 3, Paul said it like this. I want you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Well, here, Scripture commands wives to submit to their own husbands as to the Lord. Now, obviously, this command has created a bit of a stir. Many women rebel against the notion that they're to submit, to submit anywhere, especially and perhaps even to their husbands. They reject submitting because they're afraid of being dominated. They're afraid of being suppressed by their husbands. Very often, she's afraid of being made less of a person, uh, no opinions, no valid feelings. She fights against male domination, rejects the notion of male leadership, and I'm talking about Marie for just a moment. No. <laughs> well, the rejection of male leadership is demonstrated by the acceptance of male bashing. You see this in media, you see it in entertainment, you see it as that which is openly expressed constantly. I shared this once in the past, I still remember how I had shared it, and I said this, you know, in, in many commercials that we see, if you watch TV at all, in many commercials that we see, and this was true a few years ago, it would seem even more so now, um, the way that husbands are portrayed in commercials, we can't do anything, can we? we? We don't know how to do anything. It always takes my brainy wife to tell me how to do things like even buy a car. I mean, commercials are that way. It's mail bashing. It's, it happens all the time. I personally have a problem with that. I don't say much about it to anybody, obviously. But Marie can tell you this. I'll say, oh, give me a break. I'll be watching a commercial. Oh, give me a break. Are you kidding me? That's just not real. <laughs> See, but you can, you can bash a mail. It's okay to do that. But you had better never bash a female. And it's become worse and worse and more, more blatant, I think, over, over the years. And so male bashing is, is, is appropriate today, and, and, but you would never tease with ladies and all of that. You, you'd be surprised. Even in this church, everybody knows I tease my wife. I've done it several times already. I just do that. That's, that's, um, she can tell you this. When I tease somebody, it's because I feel very close to them. And for me, it's just a way that I just show affection and love. That's what I've always done. And it just comes out spontaneously. It's not like I plan on doing that. It just comes out, you know, for some reason. And, and uh, my dad was the same way. That's how he showed affection. So I just picked that up, and that's what I do. So I was doing this many years ago here in this, in this uh, sanctuary before we built the, uh, the new sanctuary. And, and I had teased Marie, and 
a lady who a lady came up after church and and said to me, I have to tell you, this is my first time here, and uh, I don't appreciate the way you spoke of your wife. And I thought, well, how interesting, you know, you, you've never been here before, but but you know how I'm supposed to treat my wife. So I slapped her and, no, <laughs> no. I didn't. I only wanted to. I, I said, I said, you're ne so this is your first time here. And she goes, yeah. I said, I said, yeah. I said, if you came here more than once, you'd see that I adore my wife and I tease her, you know. So sometimes people get very sensitive over, over those things, but we have to be careful about that. Uh, this rejection of masculinity is referred today as toxic, toxic masculinity. So to avoid charges of male domination, society has stripped men and stripped men of their authority. And so men, and I'm saying only what we already know, there are men who have become ashamed of being masculine and actually have become feminized. And yet, at the same time, I have seen that many young women have become more masculine. So what needs to be remembered is that God has created both male and female. And as such, men and women are regarded as individually equal before God. In Galatians 3.28, uh, it says there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. And so in marriage, the context of submission is between the lover and the one loved. It's not to be viewed as a servant and a master but it's to be viewed as mutual service to the Lord as we submit to one another and serve Jesus together. And so Paul makes that clear when he instructs the husbands to love. And if you look at verse 25 for a moment, he says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Husbands are to love our wives sacrificially. That's how we love our wives. And so he makes it very clear that's what we're to do. Now, focus on the family address this point well. Paul's instruction, they write, to wives has to be read in tandem with his exhortation to men. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. It should also be understood under the umbrella of the apostles' introductory admonition to all Christians of both sexes submit to one another in the fear of God. So in this context, it's been pointed out that the woman when she submits, is actually demonstrating her love for her husband. And the way she shows love for her husband is to respect. If you look at verse uh, 33 of this chapter, it says, Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself. Let the wife see that she respects her husband. And so... The way that my wife has demonstrated to me her love for me isn't simply because she, she says those words, I love you. Those words are easy to say. But the way that my wife has shown me over the years that she loves me is when she has shown me her respect. And so love for, uh, from a woman to a man is demonstrated in her willing submission to the leadership of Christ, the headship of Jesus, and the headship of her husband and the respect that she shows to the husband. Now, next week we'll be looking, or in a couple of weeks, we'll be looking at the, uh, the role of the husband. But she evidences her love for her husband and demonstrates it by her respect. And the way that a husband reveals love for his wife is by sacrificially nourishing and cherishing her, which is what he says in verse 29 of chapter 5, when he said, no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. And so, in this way, the wife is to submit to and respect their husband. And again, that's repeated. You'll see that in verses 22, 24, as well as verse 33. In a spiritual way, her submission to her husband is a picture. It's a picture of the church and Jesus Christ. So notice in verse 22 how Paul says, you are to submit, but as to the Lord. Wives, submit to your own husbands, your own husbands, as to the Lord. Submit as to the Lord. I'll never forget a woman I was speaking to on one occasion who was basically sharing with me about how her husband wasn't a good man and all of that. And 
And I, I'll never forget when I said, you know, the scriptures teach that the wife is to submit to the husband. She said, yes, to the Lord. And when he becomes as the Lord, I'll submit to him. And so that means I never will. So the submission the woman yields to the husband reveals her submission to Jesus Christ. Submission to Jesus is done for his glory and is done to please him. And as the wife submits to her husband, in fact, she's actually submitting first to the Lord. And so as we're speaking about this, let me define the word submit. The, the word submit in the English is actually a translation of a particular Greek word that can also be translated subject. Submit and subject in scripture very often is the same Greek word. And the word submit or subject is used in two basic ways. First, it's a military term. It refers to arranging divisions under the command of a leader. But secondly, it speaks of a voluntary attitude of cooperation. It speaks of yielding to or carrying a burden. So in marriage, biblical submission doesn't make a wife inferior. It doesn't degrade her and it doesn't make her weak. Biblical submission is a sign of strength because it requires strong character on the part of the wife. It's an attitude that serves to help her live a comfortable life of peace. It also is one of the evidences of her respect for her husband. And as she does this, it limits the amount of arguments. In Proverbs 20, verse 3, it says, It is honorable for a man to stop striving since any fool can start a quarrel. Now, the wife is not doormat. She's not someone with no opinion of her own. The wife has the responsibility of sharing her feelings. The wife has the responsibility of sharing her thoughts with her husband. Obviously, that's not only permissible, it's extremely important for her to do so. How else would I get to know who I'm married to if she doesn't express herself to me, right? And so she's not to just be quiet and, and never share her views. She should be sharing her views, but she does it with respect, and that's a very important thing. She needs to learn what to share, when to share, where to share, how to share, and how often to share. <laughs> it's been said a continual dripping on a very rainy day and a contentious woman are alike. And so we don't need a whole lot of the share. You shared once, I heard you, okay? So some thoughts and some ideas, some suggestions are just not necessary to share. Because very often, the comments that could be made, if not done right at the proper time, proper place, etc., is, 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 is not seen as helpful, but is really seen as criticism. And so we have to learn those things. Marie has to learn. Marie had to learn those things. I had to learn those things. You know, just because you get married doesn't mean you automatically get along in every single thing. Everything you say, you're always going to just nod your head in agreement. Of course, there are times that Marie, Marie you know, disagreed with me, and, and it, took, it took a while for her to realize how wrong she was. But, you know, <laughs> but she learned. She learned. We had to learn each other, right? I mean, every married couple knows that. You date, and in your dating situation, um, very often you're on your best behavior, and uh, you know because you're in a courtship place, and and then you get married, and then some of those things that you one time did simply because you wanted to to make points, those things are no longer necessary. There's the ring on the finger. Why do I have to do that? Some guys will uh, get that way. Sometimes ladies will do the same. Now, to, to have a good marriage requires work, and it's work every day. It's not a work you don't like. I enjoy what I do. I, I want to know my wife. The scripture says, husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. It's, it's my responsibility to, to study my wife, to know the things that please her, the things that don't please her, so that I might be able to minister sacrificially to her and know what to do in such a way that it'll be something that she's, she's happy I did. I've shared it before, but I had to learn these things in the past. I've, I continue to learn them to this day because as you grow older, you continue changing. And so there are things that you learn over time, new things that you learn. It's part of the joy of being married. It's also part of the work of being married, but it's an important thing. So you never really know them 100%, but you grow to know them better and better as, as time goes by. And, and, and the wife you know, we'll have to learn how to communicate. Marie had to learn how to tell me the things she wanted me to hear because I came from a different background. My family was more outspoken. We were more direct, and, and Marie's is more 
quiet and they, they, they didn't open up and still don't open up that much that easily. So I had to learn timing. I had to learn all these things. She had to learn it with me. And that's good. It's, it's, it's part of being married. It's part of the dance that we learned to dance together. So a lot of women have a problem, though, with the submission. And why is it so hard? Well, let me give you a couple of thoughts about, about that. Why is submitting to a husband so hard for some to do? Well, we know it's part of the fall, and it's part of the curse that came upon woman. In Genesis 3.16, after the fall, God spoke to the woman, and he said, I will greatly multiply your sorrow and your conception. In pain you shall bring forth children. He went on to say this, your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. Your desire shall be for your husband. Now, that doesn't mean that everything hubby wants, mama wants to do. I just, I'm here to please you. No. You see, that word desire is also repeated. Same Hebrew word in Genesis 4, verse 7, where it says to Cain, after his offering was refused, if you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you, but you should rule over it. The desire that is being spoken of, that word desire, both in chapter 3, verse 16, as well as chapter 4, verse 7 in Genesis, that word desire is a Hebrew word that can speak of dominating. It also speaks of devouring. So it's not that, that Eve was going to be happy doing everything Adam said. It was that Eve was going to have to fight within her nature the desire to dominate him and to rule over him. And so the Lord made that very clear from the beginning. This desire to take control and, and, and all led to the usurpation of leadership. And that's part of the fallen nature. And it's caused problems in marriage from the beginning. So what does Paul say again here in chapter 5, verse 22? Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now he begins with the wife because her situation was difficult. You see, at that time, if the husband was saved, it wasn't uh, something that would necessarily create a problem because his wife would come to church automatically because a wife could not refuse to do so. But on the other hand, if a wife got saved but her husband did not, it could be dangerous. Her husband would uh, consider her unfaithful, not only to him, but to his religious beliefs, and that would cause tremendous problems in the home, and it still does. It could be physically dangerous for the wife because the wife had no rights. You see, at that time, a Jewish woman changing her religion was absolutely unthinkable. And by the way, it still is to this day. A Greek wife was to remain indoors, bear his legitimate children, and be obedient. Because the Greeks would have the, the wife to bear the legitimate child, but he had the women on the side. The Roman woman had no rights under law, was regarded as a child. Before marriage, she was under her father's authority, and her father had the power of life and death. When she got married, this right was automatically transferred to her husband. There was a Roman statesman, his name was Cato the Elder, and he said, if you catch your wife in an act of infidelity, you can kill her with impunity without a trial. So that's what was taking place when Paul was writing this wives submitting to your husband passage. The atmosphere of the ancient world was that a woman was incapable of caring for herself. And so you'd see how brave a woman would be if she came to faith in Christ. But Paul says in verse 22, wives submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now notice, he doesn't say divorce him. He doesn't say argue with him. He doesn't say preach to him. He doesn't say give him ultimatums. He doesn't say make his lunch and put in the bread, you know, in the sandwich. You know, when he bites it, there's a piece of paper. He opens it and it says, man shall not live by bread alone. He doesn't say to do that, you know, to try and win him. He says submit. Submit. You see, biblical submission is spiritual in nature. The enemy is attempting to destroy the home, and he does that by destroying the marriage. Marriage is intended, as I've shared with you earlier, to produce godly offspring who are to not only embrace the faith of Christ, but also 
to communicate it to their own children. And so the battle for marriage is at its core a battle for the future generations. Satan especially works to undermine and destroy Christian homes. That's because marriage is a picture of Jesus and the church. So somebody says, well, that may be true in a Christian home, but what about the homes where the husband's not a believer? Why would a wife submit to a non-believer? Well, the apostle Peter repeated the command for wives to be submitted to their husbands. And in his case, he was writing concerning believing wives and unbelieving husbands. In 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2, it says, wives, Likewise, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they without a word may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. So Peter's emphasis in the passage was the value of the husband's soul. Why should she submit? In order that they may be won to Christ. Now he speaks and says that even if some do not obey the word, when he says, do not obey, in the original language, it speaks of not a mild but aggressive disobedience. Some husbands are aggressively against the Lord, and they're against a wife following Jesus Christ. Some of you know that. He's the guy who will keep you from fellowship. He doesn't want you taking the children to church. He doesn't want you to serve. He doesn't want you to change. They get upset. Sometimes I've, I've heard it over the years of my ministry What happened to her? She changed. She's not fun anymore. She doesn't want to go out anymore. She doesn't want to go to Vegas anymore. She doesn't want to to drink with me anymore. She doesn't want to go to the bars anymore. She doesn't want to dress the way she used to dress anymore. I don't like her. She's changed. And and so they get upset. And they'll say, I don't want you going to church. I I remember one lady who approached me and said, my husband has told me I, I, I cannot bring the children to church because the children should go to his church. She said, but the problem is he doesn't ever go to church. So his whole thing was he was mad because she was coming to church and changing. He didn't like it. And, and there are husbands who aggressively uh, resist this in the wife, and they get angry about it. And Peter was speaking about that. He says some do not obey the word. Some aggressively are disobedient to the commands of God. And sometimes his desire for his wife is for her to sin with him, and it can be strong, and it can be insistent. He may not be physically abusive, but he's opposed to this wife walking with Jesus Christ. And I've seen this. A wife, especially one who has been recently saved, often speaks of the Lord to her unsaved husband, and, and she, she, she got saved. God saved her, and, and she wants to share with her husband because she doesn't want him to perish and go to hell. So she tells him what she's learning, and he gets upset. You know, her heart is filled with the love of the Lord, the joy of being saved. In Acts chapter 4, verse 20, it says it like this. We cannot but speak the things which we've seen and heard. We want to talk about that. So the wife will come to church. She hears messages, a message that encourages her to share their faith. Well, they go home and they share with their husband. He doesn't want to hear it. And sometimes he gets angry. They don't like the changes. The religion becomes important to them. And they finally say, don't talk to me about this anymore. I don't want to hear it ever again. So what can be done? Well, Peter had said that they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives. We need to remember that man may be called the head, but women have influence, tremendous influence. We know that, and it's a blessing that they do. And and my wife's life is a testimony. It's a testimony of her goodness, a testimony as a Christian woman of the gospel and, and a saved wife with an unsaved husband can have an, an amazing impact uh, as she loves and cares for him. You see, Peter doesn't say divorce him. He doesn't say argue. He doesn't say preach. He says submit. She's not, I had somebody ask me this. She's not to leave him for a better husband. I've had ladies say that, well, I'm saved now. Can I divorce my husband so I can marry a Christian husband? No. How is he going to get saved? You know, the possibility of being saved when you remain with him is important. In 1 Corinthians 7, 13, Paul said it like this. A woman who has a husband who does not believe, if he is willing to live with her, let her not divorce him. You see, that's the only way possible or one of the most important ways possible that he might be won to Christ. By submitting her life to Jesus ministering to her husband, 
she may win him to the Lord. Now, of course, that's not always the case. Sometimes they are not willing to not only come to faith in Christ, but they're not willing to remain with you. So Paul went on to say in 1 Corinthians 7, 15, if the unbeliever departs, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in such cases. God has called us to peace. But what can happen? Well, Again, in 1 Peter, in chapter 3, verse 2, he said, they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. That word observe in the original language is a very powerful word. The word in Greek, is to, it's, it speaks of an intense scrutiny. It, it's a concentration that is very, very in, intense. I, I, I have always called it instant replay concentration. Your, your husband's watching a game. There's a, a call that is uh, being disputed on the field, and um, he wants to see whether that call was proper or not. He's, he thinks it's an improper call, and also, and then you come and stand in front of him and say, honey, lunch is on, and you turn the TV off. You're not going to get a good reception if you do something like that. He is concentrating on something. And so men observe their wives. M men do. We, we learn to watch our wives. That's how, over the years, I've learned my wife, not just by what she says, but how she responds to what I say, how she says what she's feeling. I've learned her over the years. She has been my, besides the scripture, she's been my number one object of scrutiny. I watch her. I, I, because I know what she likes. I know what she doesn't like. I want to do that which she likes, or if I feel like teasing her, I will do something that I know she doesn't like just because I know she's going to get mad and then I get happy and it's a lot of fun. Because <laughs> I know what she likes and what she doesn't like. But I had to learn that. It's not just in conversation. It's by observation. Because we can say one thing and do something different or perhaps do it in a way that is different than I'd have done it. So that's what you do. Husbands are to learn their wives or to observe. And what do they observe? He said they observe your chaste conduct. They closely watch you. They get a picture of what Jesus is like as they watch you. And they're observing you for two things, Peter says. They observe your pure life and they observe your loving respect. So they should see your your chaste life, your modest or pure life. But secondly, they see your fear of God. And your fear of God is revealed through your respect for the husband. They see your genuine admiration. You, you don't mouth off. You don't put him down. You don't ridicule him. You have a love for him. And you have a faith in him. And, I, and I'll say it this way. I stand in this pulpit today by the grace of God, of course. I give him all, all thanks for leading me down a path that led me here. But early in our marriage, when I wasn't doing well, and when we were, we were in, in, a, in a great difficulty, I've said this before, some of you haven't heard it. I wasn't going to share this, but I will for just a moment. Brand new Christian. Marie's a brand new Christian. I, you know, she's about a year old in the Lord. I'm only two and a half years old, three years old in the Lord. We're married. I went to the service, the military, for two years. I got out, so I go into school, taught a Bible study, met Marie. She fell in love with her Bible teacher. I was a guy with a lot of promise. God's going to use me. I had this confidence. I knew I want to be used by the Lord. She loved that about me. We, we were living in a little uh, apartment, in, and I, I had to quit school because Marie is pregnant. We're, she was going to have Corinne, our firstborn, and I, I had a very low-paying job. It was minimum wage, and we barely were making it. I mean, we, we had no money at all. I felt like an abject total failure. I mean, you know, a lot of people can... This is kind of common in my era. You know, when we got married, we didn't have people giving us, you know, huge TV sets and, and electronic equipment and outfitting our, our, our uh, apartments with new furniture. We didn't have that. That wasn't my generation. My generation was, oh, good luck. We'll see you later. And you had to go out, you know, and, and make your own 
your own way. That's what you do. We didn't, we didn't expect people to, uh, you know, we didn't send out invitations and, uh, to whatever and say, and this is my wish list and you can buy me one of these things. We didn't do those kinds of things. We didn't tell you where you could go and buy us what we wanted. We didn't do that. I mean, our reception dinner was uh, Colonel Sanders. I mean, that's what it was, you know. And and our and our marriage dinner was uh, Taco Bell. Was it Taco Bell or it was um, Jack in the Box? Yeah. And I splurged. I got I got shrimp because <laughs> I was a roller. I had two hundred dollars, and that was to my name. That's what we had. We had nothing, and so. You know, we had a little apartment in Roland Heights. Uh, we had a, we didn't have a bed. What we had is a rollout sofa, you know, so we would roll it out. We'd, we'd, we had a, a, tea, a table I bought at um, a Home Depot kind of thing, and I, it was just a little circular, maybe 18 inches, and I put some legs on it and put a cheap little um, uh, lamp on it. We had a, nine, no, it was a 19-inch 19, 19 TV. I think it was this huge 19-inch TV. We had a $99 dinette set. That was it. That's what we had. That's what I gave to this woman. My wife's a college graduate. You know, she's, she's a sh sharp woman. She's, I, you know, just adore her. And, and then I, I got depressed. I got depressed. I thought, I'm a loser. So what I used to do before I came to faith in Christ is I would deal with emotions. Believe it or not, I didn't cry. I didn't cry at all. Uh, I, I bottled them. And the only way that I ever felt that it was okay to cry was to drink. So if I drank a little, I could blame the alcohol. That's how I did it. I, there's a lot of guys who know what I mean when I say that. That's what I did. That gave me an excuse. I could blame the alcohol. And that's what I did. So I went out, bought some beer. Marie had never seen me drink or anything like that. I mean, I'm her Bible study teacher. I went out and bought some more. And that's when I got a little, got a little bit inebriated. I wasn't real sloppy drunk, but I, I certainly had drunk enough to to know I, I don't want her to see me like this. So I walked up these stairs and I went to our room and I climbed into our bed, which was our fold-out bed, and uh, and I started to cry. And th that I needed to. It was my excuse, but I, I needed to. And I still remember, she's pregnant with Corinne, I still remember hearing her footsteps going up the stairs, coming into our little room, and uh, she walk, she sits down next to me, and, and I had the pillow over my face, and I was sobbing in it. I was just crying like a child. She says, what's wrong? And I remember pulling the pillow down, and I said, I'm, you married the wrong guy. You made a mistake. You made a mistake. You married me. You deserve so much more. Look at me. I said, I am a failure. I'm a, I use the word loser. I'm a loser. I'm a failure. I want to be a pastor. But I can't show my emotions. You made a mistake. And I just sobbed. And I'll never forget, she was a young girl. She picked me, put her arm around me and lifted me towards her shoulder, put her arms around me and began to rock me. Yeah, like a baby, she rocked me and whispered in my ear and said to me, you're not a loser. God is going to use you. And she said, I believe in you. She could have torn me up. She could have. But I'm telling you, when a wife loves a man like she loves me, it makes this man want to be worthy of the love that she shows me. That's how, over the years, I have earned her respect because she didn't tear me up when she could have. And every wife knows the weakness of her husband. Every wife can point it out at any given moment. Every wife knows a thing that will make him cry if she says it. But she keeps it to herself because she tenderly loves and reverences this man. And by her faith and her love for that man, it frees him up to desire to show her the kind of love she deserves.
So people will say, I had a guy called the church and he says, that guy always talks about his wife. Marie this, Marie that, Marie. I don't get it. Well, of course you don't because you don't have a Marie in your life. That's why you don't get it. Because if you had one, you'd understand. Because my wife has made me the man I am, not by trying to make me this way, but being who she is. And her love for me has made me want to make her know how much I love her. So that's the secret we have here. That's why you see me tear up when I speak of her. She has never brought up, never one time in all of these years, ever brought up that, that day. I'm the only one who brings it up. It was dead the minute she said, I believe in you. It was dead. It's over. I believe in you. And when a wife believes in her husband, and he knows that, most husbands, many husbands, at least this husband, will do everything he can because he doesn't want to disappoint her. He wants to be that man that she wants. So submission. I was a little nervous that I might not be able to finish this, and I don't think I'm going to because we have communion tonight. This would be part one. I'll go out and get drunk next week so we can have <laughs> part two. So submission. Submission isn't just doing what I say. Submission is an attitude of the heart. And submission is revealed by the beauty of her inner being. In 1 Peter 3 verse 4, Peter spoke of of it as the, the hidden person of the heart. He said, the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. And so Paul says, wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Now, that would be regardless of her education, her spiritual maturity, her gifts, her age, or life experiences. I've had people say, my husband isn't saved. He's not interested in growing as a Christian well, your submission isn't predicated on your husband's attitude or character, not even his spiritual maturity. You see, the more mature you are, the more you will do what is pleasing to the Lord. And spiritual maturity is demonstrated by obedience to the Lord, not the amount of information you have. And so he says again in verse 22, submit to your own husband as to the Lord. Now, he's not teaching the submission of all women to all men, but he's teaching submission of wives to husbands. She submits to her own husband because she owns him as her husband. She has this personal allegiance and loyalty. She has an intimacy with this man, and she willingly submits to him because she possesses him as her own husband. In the Song of Solomon, in chapter 6, verse 3, it says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. And so there's an ownership that she has. For this husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is head of the church and savior of the body. I'm wrestling right now to see whether I should take you just in a rapid fashion through the study or pick up, because I don't know if I have that much that I can share with you next time. I'll have to make some things up. I want to serve you communion, so I'm going to close, and I'll pick up, and I'll add some more information next study. Um, but let me share with you one, one thing here. Um, I'll go back to when a husband loves a wife and the wife loves a husband, submission is much easier, and service, serving him is much easier. And it really is. We went on a trip uh, many years ago now, Marie and I, with some people in our church and other churches. We all went, I forget where, I think it was Mediterranean or something. We went with Pastor Chuck. And, and we got off at a particular site. And we were on a cruise. And there were like 300 or so people, about 300, on the cruise tour. Because there are several churches united with Calvary Chapel Coast Mesa and we got off, the, off the, the ship, and we went to a particular location for lunch. So you have to picture about 300 people. 
And so this line forms immediately. When you get somebody off the cruise ship and you're saying, it's time to eat, we're going to eat in 10 minutes, people will you know, Im immediately get in line. And so this is a long line. And I'm sitting there. At, I went and sat at a table. I just sat at the table. I'm not going to go wrestle with, with this. I'll just wait. That's what I do. But Marie walks up to me. And I had a friend of mine sitting here. And Marie walks up to me. And she says, what do you want? And I said, I don't know what they're serving. She says, oh, she says, I'll just figure it out. And I said, okay. I'm just, I'm not thinking of it, okay. So she goes and stands in line. And no, she's not pushing people out of the way. Don't you know who I am? No, she gets in the back of the line. She gets in the back of the line. And then she comes walking up to me. And she puts the plate in front of me. And I thank her. And I said, where's my napkin and drink? Go. No, I said, I said, Thank you, baby. And she went and got back in line to serve herself. The guy who was sitting next to me, his wife comes, puts her plate in front of her, and eats, starts eating. And this guy sitting right here says to me, how'd you get her to do that? He, <laughs> how'd you get her to do that? I said, do what? How did you get her to serve you? And I kind of shook my head like, what? And I, I still remember, I said, what? How did you get her to serve you? And I smiled. I said, I love her. I love her. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you get her <laughs> to serve you? I still laugh to this day. It's been 20 years, but it still makes me laugh because that's the secret. Husbands love your wives. When you love your wife, your wife loves you back. Your wife learns who you are and ministers accordingly. That's no, there's nothing wrong with, with this man's wife serving herself. That's their relationship. I don't care either way. I don't, I don't, yes, I can make my own. Yes, I can put food on a plate. Of course, who can, I can, but she won't let me. If I want to get Marie mad to this day, to this day, I... I, I, I it, Two days ago, it, it happens all the time. I'll be sitting down. If I get up, when, after she's made the meal, if I get up, the first thing my wife will say is, where are you going? And I'll say, I'm going to get, sit down. And why? I can get the, sit down. I was raised that way. My mom stood at the stove or at the kitchen sink. She would serve the family, but she never sat. My, my mom never sat. She would ask my dad first, what do you want? My dad would say, could I have this? She'd get it. And that's how I was raised. Now, I didn't ask Marie to do that. I'm a big boy. I can make my own plate. I can cook. I can do those things. But that's her service to me. She doesn't like me to get up. She doesn't like me to do things. She, want, she doesn't want me going outside anymore because I fell. <laughs> If you look closely at my ankle, there's a chain, and it's <laughs> she's holding it. So anyway, I'll talk to you ladies a little bit more about submission next time because I have so much more I want to share, and I'm not I I I've, I really I won't do this study justice without giving you a second installment if you don't mind. So let's let's close here, and we'll pick up, and I'll share with you some more next time. And Father, thank you, Lord, for the opportunity just to...